Hi, um, my name is Dr. Tom Chalimsky, uh, and I was uh, asked to give a talk. I'm actually very honored to give a talk on what is the MSA journey like? <clears throat> and I'm also entitling this, Who Lives in Your Village? Because there's no question that the MSA journey truly requires a village. As you'll see, it's not all horrible, um, but I wanna focus here not so much on pathophysiology and medical health. I wanna focus on the experience you may have, the experience you may have with your doctor and the experience you may have with your caregiver. So, um, I'm gonna talk in about five sections. I'm talking about first, um, the experience of receiving a diagnosis. Second, I'll talk about what MSA can do and what it cannot do and what you can do. Uh, we'll talk somewhat on the physical plane there. Then we'll talk about emotional changes and whether uh, emotional issues can play a role. Then we're gonna talk about how to plan ahead and what you might do. And finally, uh, we'll talk about some spiritual aspects of the treatment of MSA, which may be really some of the most glorious and most important. Um, so we start this journey in the sense that we're all human beings. Um, doesn't matter if you're a doctor, a nurse, a chaplain, uh, just a person who's got a disease, we're all the same. And some of the most precious gifts we have include life and health and a sense of purpose. And uh, diseases take that from us. And the question is how to deal with that and how to move forward in life, despite the fact that something may be affecting your health. MSA often starts insidiously. Um, there'll be a little bit of uh, maybe a bladder issue, some disturbance in your sleep. Maybe you're a little bit lightheaded when you stand up. And most of the time, people don't think too much of that until it starts to get a little bit worse. And you may go see a urologist or a sleep specialist or a cardiologist. And such a person may be unaware of MSA. So they may not even be aware that such a diagnosis is possible because it's not in their area. Uh, and the diagnosis often does not come to the front uh, when you first see somebody. Now, multiple system atrophy, MSA, um, is sometimes quite difficult to diagnose in the early stages. And that's because often there are non-motor symptoms that come before the motor symptoms. So you may have a little bit of um, low blood pressure or some issues with your bowel. Uh, and there are many reasons that people may hesitate to even mention the disorder. Uh, the first we've talked about already, if you're not a neurologist, you may feel a very shaky ground to make the diagnosis. You, this may be the first patient you've ever seen with this disorder. Um, and remember that MSA is pretty rare. You've got about 44 cases per million people. And you compare that to Parkinson's disease, which is between 500 and 1,000 times more common, about 20,000 per million people. So Parkinson's is much, much, much more common than MSA. Another reason somebody may hesitate to make the diagnosis is because well, why frighten the person if the diagnosis is so uncertain? And yet another reason would be, well, if um, we don't have any drugs that can actually change the disease, what difference would it make medically? But this is a medical perspective. I'm not so sure that if you asked uh, many of you, uh, patients, participants, uh, people who have seen a doctor, if you would agree. I think people would prefer to know if there's something bad ahead. Now, interestingly, patients 
at least my patients are so often ahead of me. They know by the time they get to my office, they know something's wrong. And how do they know? Because the symptoms keep getting worse. Um, their bladder is getting worse. The lightheadedness is getting worse. Or there keeps showing, popping up a new symptom. And I've got uh, many, many patients, but Mark is one particular one who came to my office maybe about six or seven years ago with severe orthostatic hypotension. That means that your blood pressure drops when you stand up and it'd be getting worse for three years. He had begun to notice a slight tremor in his right arm and he felt less steady on his feet. In fact, he'd had a couple of falls, but his neurologic exams uh, had been mostly normal. So no one had given him any other diagnosis besides orthostatic hypotension. So I asked him, what would you like to gain from this visit? And his wife immediately popped out the answer. Doctor, we know something's wrong. Mark just keeps getting worse. We hope you can at least tell us what the problem is. So it didn't take me long to see that he had MSA. In fact, when he walked into the office, the way he held his posture, I thought that probably was going to be the diagnosis. But the interesting thing was that uh, Mark and his wife, Susan, had already done their own research on the internet. And I was very fearful and gentle of breaking bad news to them. And they had the opposite response. They were relieved. They felt, finally, we know what's going on. And even though the road ahead may be difficult, at least it's got some kind of a shape now. So this uncertainty, some patients feel, is absolutely uh, unbearable. They cannot bear the certainty, uh, the uncertainty of not knowing what the diagnosis is. And if you're in that group, when you finally got the diagnosis, you felt a sense of relief, although a new anxiety popped in, which is how am I going to handle this incredible burden? Now, not everyone is like Mark. Some people really can't believe the diagnosis. They feel it's wrong, which it can be. It may be that the diagnosis is incorrect, um, but you should feel free to get another opinion. And if you do get an opinion, I'd recommend a neurologist who specializes in movement disorders or one who specializes in autonomic disorders because they're most likely to have seen this kind of uh, diagnosis before. Now, what's the prognosis of MSA? Um, this paper, came out in 2015, and it shows you that the prognosis is not great. Uh, the median survival from first symptom is about 10 years. Now, it's not three years, it's 10 years. And you can see that some people go on to live 15 or even 20 years. Now from diagnosis, uh, the median survival is about seven years because it typically takes about three years from first symptom to receive a diagnosis. Prognosis can be worse if you have very severe autonomic failure at the very beginning of a disease. And uh, I just make a note that some people really do live quite a long time. What about the quality of life? Well, this is a Serbian study that looked at MSA, the Parkinsonian subtype, and compared uh, 150 Serbians who had Parkinson's disease with, a, with 45 Serbians who had MSA, Parkinson's subtype. They looked at quality of life uh, at, at when they first looked at the patients, and then they looked at it a year later. And what they found was that quality of life did worsen quite, quite a lot. And the, I put the five things here that most affect the quality of life. Female gender, older age of onset, disease duration and severity, depression or anxiety, and autonomic symptoms. Now, I put an X by those factors you cannot do anything about and a Y by the factors that you can affect. And it looks like only one factor can you affect, which is depression or anxiety. The rest of it, I don't know about you, but certainly at that point in life, you're not going to affect your gender. Your age is not changeable, and the rest of it is not changeable either. So now that we've talked a little bit about 
getting the diagnosis and the prognosis, let's talk about what MSA can do and what you can do uh, to, to manage this better. The first thing to understand is that MSA is pretty specific about the areas that it affects. The name sounds like it's infinite, multiple systems, but actually it's fundamentally two systems. It's the autonomic system and the motor system. And about uh, two thirds of patients have a Parkinsonian light disorder and one third uh, have a cerebellum involvement. So in the Parkinsonian, they'll look just like Parkinson's disease with slowing and rigidity. And when the cerebellum is involved, then they'll have loss of balance. And one of the things about MSA is that falls occur very early in the disease. With Parkinson's, they might occur about 10 years or 15 years into having the disease, whereas it's only one to two years uh, with MSA once the motor systems uh, problems kick in. Now, the autonomic systems uh, involve blood pressure with orthostatic hypotension. There are bowel and bladder issues. There's difficulty with regulating your heat uh, and there are sleep disturbances. Um, it's not my purpose in this talk to discuss these um, in any detail. You'll, you'll really get some very thorough discussions from excellent people. Uh, I just wanna emphasize here, what is the experience of a patient who's going through this and what actions you can take because there's a lot you can do to make this uh, better. Now, it's important to emphasize what multiple system atrophy does not do to you. Um, although there are reports of cognitive changes, and there certainly are cognitive changes, these are by and large quite mild and not dominating in any way. Uh, so I would call that minimal. Most people do not experience a change in their ability to fundamentally be thoughtful and converse and have meaningful exchanges other than through the motor system, for example, when they no longer have the ability to generate language or speech because their motor systems fail. There's no issue with feeling, with vision, hearing. There is some pain, typically not severe, but more and more studies are coming to light about the pain of MSA. Now, there is a Chinese study that you may find that's uh, found rather profound frontal lobe dysfunction in the patients in China. And the risk factors here included MSAP, more severe disease, more severe depression, and more severe orthostatic hypotension. And actually about three quarters had moderate to severe what's called frontal behavior changes, meaning that they are not able to make uh, meaningful decisions. And they had uh, some eating dysfunction, depression, irritability, and those with MSA Cerebellar had more severe sleep issues, apathy, and agitation. Um, this is really not in keeping with uh, what I have discovered over time with my patients with multiple system atrophy. I've cared for um, many dozens, probably over 100 or 150 patients, and I have really never seen clinically significant uh, behavioral changes um, involving the frontal lobe. There are other issues involved which do occur uh, and sometimes require some medications, particularly depression and anxiety that we'll talk about later. Uh, I just wonder, I have cared for two patients who were Asian, uh, who had a multiple system atrophy, both of whom had very significant behavioral changes. And there's some suggestion that the Asian form of multiple system atrophy may be different than the uh, European form. Uh, so this, this report may actually not be relevant to um, non-Asian patients. Now this study was done by Dan, who I believe is giving a talk later, Dan, Dr. Dan Klassen. Uh, and was done in cooperation with the company Lundbeck, who um, uh, is uh, responsible for the availability of one of the orthostatic hypotension drugs. So they studied about 500 pa patients and caregivers altogether. And 
they looked to see what their uh, experience with the diagnosis of orthostatic hypotension is. Now, uh, it's important to understand that uh, the about 10% had NSA, the rest had many other diagnoses. So this is more specific to orthostatic hypotension itself, but I believe this is highly uh, applicable to people who have multiple system atrophy. Um, so it may not surprise you that 70% found that they had a frustrating path to diagnosis. Some saw more than three doctors before they got a diagnosis of orthostatic hypotension. More than half never got a formal diagnosis of orthostatic hypotension. Some of this is the doctor's fault. Some of this is the patient's fault. But I think it's important to understand that a lot of people didn't even mention orthostatic symptoms or the impact of these symptoms to their doctor. So it's important for you as the patient to mention this. We'll go into this in more detail in just a moment. About one quarter of caregivers and patients were given the three most key management tools. So that means three quarters did not get these very important management tools that are not drugs. So these are increased salt, wearing compression stockings, and elevating the head of the bed. Um, so, so this tells us that there's a gap. There's a gap in how patients tell doctors about their symptoms. There's a, doctors in how, there's a gap in how doctors assess what their patients are experiencing. Now, 25% didn't, didn't receive any recommendation at all from their doctor. And the impact of OH was quite significant. It reduced activities in more than 50%. And it caused anxiety, worry, and discouragement. So that really brings up how should you relate to your doctor? Your doctor is part of the, the village and is a very, very important member of that village. So you need to select that doctor. You need to be able to trust them. They need to be able to trust you. And most doctors aren't going to know everything about MSA. They may not even know much about MSA, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is, are they willing to learn with you? Are they willing to get the best recommendations from the literature? Uh, or are they willing to work with a specialist? So when you see your doctor, you may ask them in, in a very respectful way, have you seen patients with multiple system atrophy or orthostatic hypotension? And what has been your experience? Uh, if, if you haven't, that's fine. But do you have a specialist that you know who knows this disease and you can work with? Are you willing to review information that I can get from the internet with, from reliable sources like the NIH or the MSA Coalition? And does the doctor seem eager to learn with you, to be your coach? And another important question is, are they gonna care for you as a whole person, with your caregiver, with your family? Uh, are they going to care for not just your physical body and your symptoms, but also attend to your mental state? And if you're a person who's interested, attend to your spirit. Uh, the caregiver's health is a very important thing. So if you were to come to me or come to another physician, what might a physician ask you to do to make the visit most effective for you? And I think a very important thing is not to try to address too much. MSA can be absolutely overwhelming. You may be overwhelmed, but if the doctor is also overwhelmed, they're not going to be able to help you. So you want to try to address no more than three issues. Save the rest for another visit. Pick the three most important, put them on a pad, and that's all you're going to get done that visit. And start by telling the doctor you have two or three, however many you have, you have this number of things you want to address, so that way they can pace the visit. For each issue, it's really important to state the problem clearly. Like, whenever I stand up, I just feel tired and drained. Sometimes I'm lightheaded. Sometimes I feel like I'm gonna, I'm gonna faint. And then explain the impact of the problem. It's not just that you have a symptom, but this is stopping you from doing something. Make sure that the doctor understands that. No need to be dramatic, but just be factual. And then look for the doctor's diagnosis. The diagnosis should have, the doctor should have some 
possibilities. Like maybe you have a hormonal problem, or maybe you have orthostatic hypotension, or maybe you're dehydrated. Whatever that might be, there should be some thoughts there. It, in this very fast paced life we have, it's very easy to go from, oh, you got problem X, let me give you drug Y, without thinking about that very important step, what is the diagnosis? Um, again, 50% in the Lundbeck study we just covered never were told they had orthostatic hypertension. And this is not just important for you to know, it's important for the doctor to take that step to formalize the diagnosis in their mind, because if they don't, they may not select the right treatment or select any treatment at all. So this is really key. Now, what you can expect from your doctor. Drugs are really a minor part of managing MSA because A, they don't work very well, and B, they're really at the last stage. There's lots of non-drug solutions that your doctor can provide for you. Uh, there's lots of work that's been done on how to manage blood pressure without drugs, how to manage bladder issues, how to manage bowel issues. So your doctor should give you two or three things that you can try to see if they work or not. And if not, that's okay. You can go to the MSA Coalition website and look it up and then check with them and develop a collaborative spirit that way. If you can't seem to work with your doctor in that way, then they may not be the best fit. You need to find somebody with whom you can work and the trust is flowing easily. Uh, clearly not all these uh, devices work for everyone, and, but they, they can be very, very helpful. Now, let's turn to what you can do apart from the healthcare system. And there's a lot you can do. The first thing I wanna emphasize is exercise program. And, um, Physical therapy has been shown to be very effective in Parkinson's disease. It enhances balance, it enhances gait performance, both short-term and long-term, and it reduces fall rates. And falls are, as you well know, a big deal. So we want to try to reduce falls as much as we can. Uh, this was a study of 130 people with Parkinson's disease. They did a home aerobics program, and they compared that to stretching. And the home aerobics program beats the stretching program hands down. Uh, the, the motor score was 4.2 point, points better. So that's well accepted now in Parkinson's disease. Any movement disorders doctor will tell you that. But what about MSA? There's not a lot of literature, but uh, this paper compared 10 people with MSAP and 10 people with Parkinson's disease. Since we know this works in Parkinson's disease, Let's see if people with MSAP also improve when you give them physical therapy. So this had to be early stage. They had to be ambulatory without assistance. They couldn't be in a wheelchair. And they received a five-day inpatient therapy, one hour per day. Uh, and this included strength, flexibility, posture, balance, transfers, swings, walking, coordination, dual tasks, and a stair climb. And then they received a home-based 10-day study a 10-day uh, intervention where they exercise one hour per day on their own. So they found that the inpatient intervention worked very well. They found increase in gait velocity, stride length, maximal toe clearance, all of which are good predictors for good balance and improving falls. This improved equally in both MSA and PD. Since we know it works in PD, that means that it must work in MSA too. The improvement was best after the inpatient treatment. The home treatment changed things less. The clinical rating scales did not change for either PD or MSA, so that means we don't really find a change that a doctor would determine as being significant, but the patients clearly experienced a lot of benefit, and there were no falls or faints reported. These are some of the exercises they did in this study. You can see here getting up from a chair, and walking with large arm and leg movements, which are a big problem in both MSAP and MSAC. My own experience is that physical therapy is one of the most underutilized and valuable referrals that I make when I see anyone with MSA. And patients are so happy that they can actually do something for themselves when they go to see the physical therapist. 
I developed particular physical therapists and occupational therapists that I work with over time because they are more familiar with the problems encountered in both MSA and Parkinson's disease. For those who are really early in their stage, I, I emphasize what's called interval training, which means you go fast and you go slow. For example, you get on an exercise bike, you go fast and you go slow. And you do core exercises uh, using Pilates style training. Why core exercises? Because it enhances your ability to maintain your postural stability, which reduces your risk of fall. And every physical therapist needs to, accept, uh, needs, needs to uh, explore gait safety, uh, perhaps using balance training and other types of training. And if a patient has had a fall, I will typically send the physical therapist home for what's called a home safety evaluation. Uh, balance therapy, again, is very useful in both. Yoga is also very helpful and is superior to stretching and resistance training exercise. This was 138 patients with Parkinson's disease, where it actually affected the moods, anxiety, depression, perceived hardship, and health-related quality of life. So if you have yoga available, that is something I would try as well. The question I often get is, what if I worsen suddenly? What if suddenly uh, I've been sort of get, going on a course and doing okay, and suddenly now I'm falling, I'm doing poorly, uh, things seem to have taken a drastic turn for the worse. Well, the good news is that MSA just doesn't do that. It does not worsen suddenly. In fact, neurodegenerative disorders in general tend to keep a steady pace. They tend to keep worsening. This is sad news because it's unrelenting, but it's happy news in a sense that if you have an acceleration, it's due to something else. Now, what could it be? Well, there's a lot of different things it could be. Probably the most common thing I've seen is an intercurrent infection, like a urinary tract infection. Often you won't even have any symptoms, you won't know, so go to, the, go to your doctor and get your urine tested. Uh, even if, they, uh, if you have no symptoms, just get it tested. It's cheap and it's easy. You could have a virus of the respiratory GI tract. You could have uh, something in the bowel. So I've seen patients with shingles suddenly take a turn for the worse. Of course, all this gets better when the infection is treated. Uh, worsening anxiety or depression. More, I would say at least 10 or 15% of my patients have had that as a cause for the worsening. It's not that their motor systems got worse. It's that they just got so despondent about the disease and you can understand why that they um, uh, really felt like they were suddenly worse. And then diseases like hypothyroidism, Addison's disease, or the toxic effect of medication and many, many other reasons, but it is typically not multiple system atrophy itself. So now I wanna talk a little bit about the emotional side of MSA and what I've seen with my patients uh, and how they've managed different things. I have learned so much from them over the years. Uh, and I have to say, my patients with MSA are some of my, the dearest patients I have treated over the years. So there's no question that mood disorders are common. Uh, it'd be hard to imagine that they wouldn't be. You're, you've got a disease that's got an inexorable progression. You know that your prognosis is somewhere between five and 10 years, how would you not have some aspects of mood disorder associated with that? So studies find anywhere between a quarter and even two thirds of patients, they use different scales. Uh, some of these studies are done in China, some of them are done in Europe, some of them are done in, uh, in the United States. But it's clear that at least a large minority of patients with MSA have depression and anxiety, and it typically correlates with health status. So if you're doing worse, you're less, uh, you're doing less well emotionally. No surprise there. Uh, and also anxiety seems to be worse with orthostatic hypotension. We saw that earlier in the study uh, that uh, Dr. Klassen had done when um, orthostatic hypotension led to people feeling uh, really anxious about 
of walking around. And that's something you need to convey to your doctor if that is your case. My own experience is that patients are frequently depressed or anxious. Uh, and this is actually, in a funny way, good news because those are both treatable. MSA is not. So it responds to medication, it responds to cognitive behavioral therapy. It's really important not to hide it. Uh, if you want your caregiver to be the one to bring it up, that's fine, that may be easier for them, but bring it up to your doctor because they can do something about it. And uh, try to be as specific as you can about that, just as you would be about orthostatic hypotension. Now, what about the caregivers? Um, the caregivers can become depressed also, and that can go very stealth, unseen, because no one's paying attention to these caregivers who are working, some of them, 20 hours a day, sleeping four hours a day, and on and on for months and years like this. Um, I actually saw with my own mom, who might taking care of my dad with Parkinson's disease, and she would never let anyone come in and give her a break because she was afraid that they wouldn't take care of him as well as she could. That may be true, but she really needed a break. Um, so um, caregivers get very burdened. They get fatigued. Uh, and the biggest factor that you have to watch out for uh, now I'm really talking to physicians who might be uh, taking care of these patients, is that the caregiver gets depressed. If the caregiver gets depressed, that becomes interactive with the patient. And so it's likely that they both get depressed. So you have to watch for that. And how do you take care of that? Well, caregivers need a break. Again, it takes a village. So there are many ways of giving caregivers a break. Family members can come in. Uh, Nursing, um, nursing services can come in, hospice can come in. We'll talk about hospice in a little bit, but it's very important. This is a marathon, not a sprint. So you've got to watch what's happening to the caregiver. Uh, a Korean study found that caregivers were extraordinarily fatigued. Uh, it didn't matter if the person they were caring for had a neurodegenerative disease or cancer but their fatigue score was around 60 out of 100. So the score is from 20 to 100. So they were quite fatigued. And the main factors that they found were important for caregiver fatigue were the caregiver anxiety and depression and how long the disease had been going on, no surprise. How do you treat this? How do you treat anxiety? How do you treat depression? Well, my very good friend and psychologist, Dr. Jeff Janata, taught me years ago that behavioral activation is the main treatment for all of these. Behavioral activation means finding what you enjoy and can still do and do this. If you enjoy seeing your kids, have them come in, have them enjoy visiting with them, grandkids enjoy visiting with them, listening to music and so on. So, Again, finding the joy in your life and relaxing in any way that you can. This is called behavioral activation, meaning that you're engaging in a behavior that makes you active, that activates you. That is a major treatment for these. Drugs are very helpful. Cognitive behavioral therapy, which is where you sit with a psychologist who teaches you how to, who trains your brain to, um, uh, to the, give, give the, your brain the skills to reject negative thoughts and to engage instead of in positive thoughts, that is a very important technique uh, and can be extremely useful. Okay, so the next section I want to talk about is planning ahead. And um, that's a very important part of this disorder. Now, there's not been, to my knowledge, any advanced planning studies um, in multiple system atrophy, but there have been quite a few in Parkinson's disease. And you can see here, the numbers are somewhat astounding. So in one sur survey, 76% of patients with Parkinson's had not done any advanced care planning. 
And yet 70% of this group would have wanted to engage in this uh, once they heard about it. And 18% that had done planning was mostly around things like wills and the like that people do all the time. I've done it and I don't have a disorder. So it was not specific to the fact that they had a disorder. So there's a big movement now that palliative care should be started much earlier in the disease. What is palliative care? Well, palliative care, people think of palliative care and hospice like, okay, it's over, I'm dying. Well, it's just the opposite, actually. Palliative care is there to help you live your life rather than live your disease. So rather than constantly living about the fact that you're sick with an illness, palliative care is here to help you find ways to live your life, again, with behavioral activation and enjoy the things you can enjoy instead of living through the disease. Here's the definition. It's an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problem associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. Now, uh, this particular paper compared the phases of palliative care in the uh, atypical Parkinson's, which is typically multiple system atrophy, and Parkinson's disease. And what you see here on this slide, uh, on this graph, is this time on the uh, x-axis here above. And here are the different phases of palliative care. White is a diagnosis phase. Gray is a maintenance phase. You just, somebody's just on carbidopa, L-dopa, and they're just going on and really living mostly a normal life. And then they get more complicated. They start developing sphincter disturbances. And, and then finally, they get palliative care toward the end of their life in the last two or three years. Now, with multiple system atrophy, you can see, first of all, that everything's compressed because the diagnosis period is much longer. It's about three years here on this graph, which is pretty accurate. The gray maintenance phase is very short and they get complex right away. People with multiple system atrophy right away have orthostatic hypotension and bladder issues and bowel issues. And these are very complicated. So you can see this gray maintenance period is almost non-existent in people that have um, multiple system atrophy. And the idea is to get people into palliative care as soon as possible so that they can begin to plan and begin to live as normal a life as possible. So how does this work? And this is a very nice uh, review by Wildlin. Um, the idea is that you have sort of a door and uh, as long as things remain simple and easy to manage, you don't see the palliative care specialist because they can't see everybody and you're seeing your general doctor or general neurologist. And then as soon as things get special, get difficult, then you go see the um, palliative care person. Significant distress, maybe need for hospice services, difficult pain management and other things like this. So these are two revolving doors. And the idea is they're working together to provide you, the patient, with the best possible care at all times. Now, sometimes hospice is the best setting to obtain this kind of help. I, I really don't want anyone here to think of hospice as I'm throwing in the towel. It's not that. Um, Don Summers, who was the founder of the MSA Coalition, who's, who used to put on a, uh, a conference every single year, used to always say, I wish I had learned about hospice services earlier. Do it early. His wife had died at MSA. A large benefit of hospice is for the caregiver. Now, a doctor only needs to certify that you may die in the next six months. For MSA, that's typically true starting at least three or four years before the average person will uh, succumb to the disease. So you can certify a person, I will certify a person for hospice and I'll bring up hospice pretty early in the disorder so that the caregiver can have respite, 
so that the patients can receive uh, various services that are otherwise not available and paid for by Medicare. Now, what about dying itself? Um, none of us really like to face the idea that we're going to die physically. Uh, and that's a tough sell. Yet, it's a fact. Whether you have MSC or not, all of us are going to die. As they say, the only three things that are sure are that we're going to, we're going to be born, or we were born, we're going to pay taxes, and we're going to die. And there are very few studies that address the experience of dying or how to prepare. Now, if you're very interested in this topic, uh, there are a series of books by Kubler-Ross that really go into depth uh, in the experience of dying and their excellence. Uh, they really help understand what the process of death looks like. And they're quite hopeful because so many of the patients she studied had these light experiences where they went to the other side and came back or where they saw heaven or they saw other things like this. So is there, they're really encouraging books to read about because the fear in dying, of course, is that that's the end, which uh, I personally do not believe that it is. But the inexorability of progression of MSA can really exhaust and discourage you. Every month is a new symptom. Something else is wrong. And whatever you gained in physical therapy has now been lost somewhere else. I, I like this particular um, slide that shows this diagram that shows sort of a cycle of acceptance and uh, so this struggling and acceptance, and then you go on to um, living with, here's advanced cancer because it's from the cancer literature, but living with advanced multiple system atrophy, you share the experience with your family or other people who have a similar disorder, and then you're reconstructing life in a new way. So you're living well with the awareness of dying. So this cycle uh, puts you back in the seat of living as opposed to this constant feeling that you're, that you're dying. Um, but preparing for death is an important thing and doing so in a healthy way uh, it can, can take a lot of skill. I have to say that I have spoken to many, many of my patients uh, and their spouses after the patients died or when they were in that very end stage. And there are very few, I can't say there are none, but there are very few who struggled with uh, a very difficult death experience. Most of them uh, were at great peace and the certainty that they were with God. I wanna finish in the last couple of minutes with what MSA cannot do. And I wanna talk about a beautiful study that was done uh, and it published in a pastoral journal uh, about the spiritual side of MSA. Uh, MSA cannot touch your spirit, that's eternal. And by the way, I have never met an unkind person with MSA. Every person I've ever met who has MSA has been kind. So if you're worried about MSA, then maybe if you become very mean, uh, that's protective, you cannot get it. And I've heard the same thing said about um, neurologists who see uh, ALS, uh, that it's also patients, you have to be kind in order to get it. So one of the hardest things I think that I've seen is how to help patients through uh, this loss of self-esteem. So many, and most of my patients, men and women were able-bodied and athletes and they once, did incredible things and they supported other people. And all this was effortless for them. And now not only has this become impossible, but just living life every day has become hard. So what happens? You, you're now living life, you wanna be a helper, but you fear that you've become a burden. And that burden on your family, on your caregiver becomes an additional burden on you. Because not only can you not help and can you not do things, but now you feel like you've lost your very 
your very soul. Well, I think this little story in, uh, in Luke 10 uh, at least helps me to understand this a little bit better. So this is the story of uh, Mary and Martha, and most of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with it, but I'll just read it to you. As they continued their travel, Jesus entered a village. A woman by the name of Martha welcomed him and made him feel quite at home. She had a sister, Mary, who sat before the master, hanging on every word he said. But Martha was pulled away by all she had to do in the kitchen. Later, she stepped in, interrupting them. Master, don't you care that my sister has abandoned the kitchen to me? Tell her to lend me a hand. So that's a nice way Martha was blaming two people at the same time. She blamed Jesus for not doing the right thing and telling her sister to go lend a hand, and her sister for not lending a hand. But Jesus wasn't so easily fooled. He said to uh, the master, said, Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. One thing only is essential, and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course and won't be taken from her. And what I get from this story is the greatest gift you can give to your caregiver as a patient or to the person you're caring for, if you're the caregiver, is to emphasize the joy of being together over anything else and to emphasize the inner peace of being together, the inner peace that flows from you. And those are a greater gift than anything you can do for that person physically. This paper covers uh, spiritual health uh, and I, I thought is, is really a glorious um, paper. This is, came, it came actually out of Mayo. Um, it's 12 people with neuro neurodegenerative disorders enrolled in something called Hear My Voice, which is Directed Spiritual Life Review and Development of a Spiritual Legacy Document. Uh, they had all kinds of different disorders, very comparable to um, MSA. The median age was 66. Their professions were educators, healthcare, business, pastors. Um, now, they were all active Christians, presumably not because they selected them that way, but because Hear My Voice is a Christian um, faith-based um, program. So this may or may not apply to other faiths. Uh, what they found was that for most of the patients, prayer and hymns gain a lot of importance when the church is no longer possible. They described feeling closer to God and their faith grew. They emphasized the importance of gratitude for the lives they had lived and the ability to care for others when they could. Some of them were surprised at others, doctors and caregivers, assuming that because they couldn't speak very well, they had no lucidity, and one person was crying because they were reprimanded for their inability to write. But the main messages they provided were love your family, be grateful for them, God loves you, and therefore you love others. And most maintained or increased their spiritual scores on various instruments that they measured. And I want to end with some quotes from some of the patients. I enjoy the silence of Quaker worship. Though for the past year or so I haven't been attending, but I value sitting quietly and listening for the leadings of the spirits. Eventually, I will come to accept it all and put it all in God's hands, but right now I'm not there yet. This is different quotes from different patients. I said to the Lord, okay, what is going on? Give me a break because I just felt so abandoned. I feel that God is asking me to take the focus off myself and put more focus on Jesus. I think you have to center on God every day and pray to him every day. Physical health has slowed me down, but it hasn't stopped me. I think for me, it has not only changed my life, it has changed uh, my husband, and that is a concern. I'm concerned about being a burden. I'm going to end there, and thank you very much for allowing me to uh, uh, give you this talk and talk about my experience in caring for all of you. I'm very thankful to the MSA Coalition for allowing me to give this talk, and I'm very thankful to all of my patients with multiple system atrophy who have truly taught me so much. Thank you.